Hello. My name is Dr. William Henry Worcestershire. I have an interesting case that I would like you to think about. I have a patient whom I met three days after she was admitted for diabetic ketoacidosis. I will never forget her. She was a lovely mum of 87 years who spoke incessantly of her love for shrubbery. She was blind and had both legs amputated at the knee but claimed it was only a flesh wound. She talked about how at one point in time, she had constructed a huge wooden rabbit, and an incredible knowledge of the European swallow. She talked of her life which was at one point rich with family and friends that are no longer living. She mentioned to me that she had lost all desire to live. I examined her for signs of depression and dementia, but there was no evidence of either. In fact she was completely coherent and was not under the influence of any mind-altering substances. She knows she will die if she refuses insulin, and she says that is what she wants, so my question to you is what would you do with a patient such as this or if you happen to encounter a knight who says knee? Which of the following would you choose? Would you discharge her after she has signed an against medical advice form? Or would you seek a court order to appoint a legal guardian? How about simply offering insulin but allowing the patient to refuse it? Would you consider admitting the patient to a psychiatric unit? Would you attempt to administer insulin against the patient's wishes? This is a question about capacity to consent to medical intervention. More specifically, this question is asking us if our patient has the cognitive ability to consent to, or refuse, a medical intervention. In our case, the patient is refusing a life-saving medical intervention that will result in imminent death if refused. Most say legally there are four elements to determine capacity. These are 1. Understanding. 2. Appreciation. 3. Reasoning and 4. Choice. In more simple terms, the patient must understand the relevant information. The patients must appreciate the information and its consequences. The patient must reason about treatment options. And finally, the patient must communicate a choice. Also, the patient should not be under the influence of mind-altering substances. A competent patient has the right to make an unreasonable decision. However, when a patient lacks the competence to make a decision about treatment, substitute decision makers must be sought out. In descending order these substitute decision makers include them 1. The patient's spouse. 2. Adult children or a majority of the adult children reasonably available. 3. Parents of the patient. 4. The patient's siblings. And finally 5. The nearest living relative of the patient. Therefore, in this scenario, we must think about whether or not the patient has capacity to consent. Here, the patient has certainly communicated a choice about not desiring treatment. The patient understands that she has diabetic ketoacidosis and that it requires insulin. She appreciates the fact that if she does not get insulin that she will die. She also demonstrates that she can reason. She says that she wants to die because she no longer values living. In addition, we know that she is not on mind-altering drugs. We evaluated her for dementia to ensure that she still has the cognitive ability to make decisions. We also evaluated her for depression to rule out any psychiatric illness contributing to her decision. Now, looking at potential options, would you want to seek a court order to appoint a legal guardian? No, we would not. Legal guardians, such as those we appoint to geriatric patients who are demented, would not be appropriate in this case. The patient shows no impairment with respect to capacity and would not need a legal guardian. Would you admit her to a psychiatric unit? Again, the answer to this question is no. We evaluated her for signs and symptoms of depression. If she were depressed, or exhibited signs of other mental illness, it could possibly contribute to her decision to refuse treatment. If she were depressed, she would not have capacity to consent, or refuse consent. Since this is not an emergent condition, 
the proper course of action in that case would be to get to court order to administer insulin against the patient's wishes. After she was stabilized, we would then want to admit the patient to a psychiatric unit to manage her depression and other psychiatric illness. Would you try to administer insulin against the patient's wishes? Again, this answer is incorrect because the patient has capacity to refuse treatment. It would be acceptable to administer treatment against a patient's wishes if the patient lacks capacity and has a life-threatening emergent condition, in which obtaining a court order would result in patient injury or death. In this case the patient has capacity to refuse treatment, and does not have an emergent life-threatening condition. If the patient did not have capacity, the next appropriate action would be to obtain a court order to administer insulin against the patient's wishes. If we were to forcibly give her insulin, it would be assault, and we could go to jail. Would you discharge the patient after she has signed an against medical advice form? This would not be appropriate, because we would essentially be kicking the patient out of the hospital. Even if she refuses life-saving intervention and chooses to die, the hospital can still offer her many services to ease her suffering. Therefore. The appropriate answer is to offer insulin but to allow the patient to refuse it. The patient has capacity to refuse treatment because she demonstrates the criteria for capacity, which are understanding, appreciation, reasoning, and choice. However, by allowing the patient to stay in the hospital, instead of discharging her against medical advice, she will benefit from comfort care as the untreated diabetic ketoacidosis results in her death. I hope you have enjoyed the case, and should you happen to encounter a knight who says knee, a nice shrubbery would be the logical choice.